I know that I'm quite the athletic specimen, so this will come as no surprise to you, but I was a track and field guy in high school. So I was a distance runner. Uh, I was not very good. Um, yeah. I ran the mile and the 800 in the track, and uh, the mile is a distance event, but really when you understand track as I understand track, the 800 is not a distance, uh, it's not a distance event. It is a two-lap sprint for those who are good at it. It's a two-lap jog for those who are bad at it. <laughs> and those who are good at it, it's pretty impressive. So I, I saw a former student of mine down in Indiana who ran the 800 in a minute and 53 seconds. That was fun to watch. It was not fun to watch me run the 800, <laughs> all right? Uh, but in junior high, I also did high jump. Uh, I know a little short guy doing high jump is, is kind of crazy, but it was fun. I was actually somewhat decent at it for my height. Had a lot of fun doing it, except for when you land on the bar. That does not feel good. <laughs> In eighth grade, I was probably, I'm guessing, 90 pounds, and my track coach, I, he was just joking with me, and I didn't pick up on it, wanted me to throw shot put one, one meet. So I threw shot put one meet. I was terrible at that, too, but it was a lot of fun. In high school, I started working on pole vault. How many of you have ever pole vaulted before? Anybody? It's a lot of fun, except for when you land on the bar. Really not fun when you land on the bar. Uh, but pole vault's a lot of fun, but it's very technical, actually. Uh, there's a lot of technical things that go into being a pole vaulter. You don't just pole vault. There's technique you have to learn. You have to work on it. Um, you're, you need to approach with speed, and the speed will help when you have the right technique. The speed will help vault you over that, uh, over that pole. It's really cool. My high school... Uh, pole vault instructor, his name was, was Mr. Yankovic, and he had pole vaulted at Boston College. So he had pole vaulted in college 18 foot 6 inches. That's pretty cool. That was pretty cool to watch. His son was on the team too, and he regularly vaulted between 13 and 15 feet in, in high school, which is pretty good. Wasn't the best in the state, but he was among the best in the state. It was a lot of fun to watch him. We had a blast together. Um, I did what you call straight pulling it, okay? I didn't bend the pole because I, yeah, I didn't bend the pole. I would sprint down that runway and I would put that stick in the ground and I would hope I made it over. It was a lot of fun. I thought I was doing everything that my coach was instructing me to do. I really did. But then my, my um, coach's wife started videotaping us. And she started showing us the videotape of ourselves pole vaulting. And it was then that I realized that sad truth that the tape don't lie. <laughs> I was not running very fast. <laughs> In fact, I was slowing down as I got closer to the pit, which if you've pole vaulted is not gonna equal success. I was ruining my momentum. I knew my arms were collapsing around the pole anyways. I wasn't pushing like I was supposed to and pulling like I was supposed to. I was, I was straight pulling it. So the fact that I was able to jump 10 foot six in high school was actually kind of impressive because I was straight pulling it and I was slow and non-athletic. If I had just trusted my coaches more and if I had been able to see what I did and actually apply the difference from a different perspective into my pole vaulting, I might have been much better. It was when my perspective changed from thinking I was doing something to actually seeing myself not do it, that everything was different. The videotape showed me a new perspective. Today I want us to start our sermon series on the letter to the Philippians, the book of Philippians. Uh, it's in, I've entitled this sermon series, Refocus. It's the beginning of the new year. Uh, it's a time to refocus our hearts and our minds towards what God is calling us to. And as we look at the book of Philippians together, it'll offer an opportunity to refocus our lives on what's most important, the word of God. This week, we're going to look at verses 1 through 26, and our theme for refocus this week is focus on perspective. Now, before we get going, I want us to do a little background information on the book of Philippians. This will give us the ability to read everything we're going to read within context, because context is very important. 
Too often we read scripture and use it in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. It's our goal to read within the context of what was written, who it was written to, and for what purpose. And this is really important as we move forward in scripture. With Philippians, it's even more important in some ways because in this short letter, there's about six or seven very well-known passages that people memorize, that people run to, and we want to make sure we're taking it in context and understanding it in context. There is one verse that we will get to towards the end of this series that is often misused. It's often taken out of context to mean something it doesn't mean, and so we're going to hit that when we get there, but it's our, it's our goal to read within context and understand it to the best of our ability the way it was meant to be understood. So a little about Philippians. This letter was written by Paul to the church at Philippi. And Paul had started the church at Philippi on his second missionary journey. If you look up there on the map, it'll show you the journey, his second missionary journey. And up towards the top middle is the city of Philippi. And he he went there. Acts chapter 16 tells us how the Holy Spirit actually led him to Philippi, to Macedonia, which is where Philippi is located. So Acts 16, 6 through 10 reads this. And I mispronounce a lot of things here, so just bear with me. And they went through the region of Pergia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately We sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So Paul wasn't even intending on going to Macedonia, but he felt the Holy Spirit leading him. And so he went to Macedonia and he preached to the Philippians. Now, Philippi was a very, uh, very Roman province. It it was filled with a lot of Roman ex-military officers there. It was very Roman, heavily influenced by Roman culture and Roman gods. And Paul, according to further reading in Acts chapter 16, he met a lady named Lydia in Philippi. And she and her household believed and in God and were baptized. And it's likely that the church in Philippi met at Lydia's house for a long time. Acts 16 also tells us of the conversion of the jailer and his household and a slave girl, all who helped make up the church of Philippi. They were the starters of the church at Philippi. And this church was very faithful. That's something we need to understand. This church was very faithful. The Philippian church had aided in the forming of the church at Corinth and the church at Thessalonica. They were, they were partners with Paul in that. They had financially helped, they had sent people to help, and they had helped start those churches. This was a giving church. That's another thing we need to understand. And it wasn't giving from wealth. It was giving out of their poverty. And so they were a giving church, and they helped Paul out on numerous occasions. And Paul felt very affectionately towards this church. The letter was written, was written not out of a spirit of correction, which a lot of Paul's letters are written out of a spirit of correction, like the Corinthian letter. Uh, but this letter was written out of genuine appreciation for the Philippian church and who they were. And he's, he simply wants to encourage them to remain faithful. There's really only one small area in this book where where Paul really corrects something, and it's like two sentences where he's correcting a couple ladies who are quarreling with one another, and he's just calling them to unity. Unity is a big theme in the book of Philippians. Paul is encouraging his church to work together, to not worry about petty differences and all that kind of stuff, to work together towards the common goal. When Paul writes this letter, he is also most likely in prison in Rome. Now, some have suggested that he was in prison in Ephesus at the time, but many scholars feel pretty comfortable that this particular letter was written while he was in Roman prison. He will allude to his imprisonment 
and he will use that as a way to encourage the church. One other quick note about why Paul wrote this letter is because the church at Philippi had sent a man named Epaphroditus to Paul while he was in prison. So among the people of Philippi was a man named Epaphroditus. Why are none of you naming your children Epaphroditus, by the way? (laughs) I think it's a great name. We might be the only church that would still have an Epaphroditus. Keep that in mind. Um, But they had sent him to prison with a gift of financial gift to help Paul and to encourage Paul and hopefully to help him get out of prison. And Paul was so grateful for this church that they cared enough to send him that he wanted to thank the Philippians. And Epaphroditus actually almost died on this journey. He, he got very, very sick and he almost died. So we have this letter here written to, the, to Philippi to encourage faithfulness. And this is a good, faithful church, and Paul loved them dearly. And so let's dig in, let's see what it's all about. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 of Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance for you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love will ab- may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the, full, the fruit of the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, these first 11 verses kind of set the tone for the entire love letter. Within these first 11 verses, we will see a greeting followed by two separate but quick prayers. Verses 1 and 2 are the greeting of the letter. And it's easy to read this plea and not pick up on things, but I believe Paul is very crafty in how he opens these letters. His greeting will tell us some things right away. His greeting says this, Paul and Timothy. So Paul is credited with the letter, but Timothy is also with him in this letter. Timothy was writing it with him. Timothy was working with Paul, and Paul held Timothy in very high esteem. While Paul is the author that is credited, Timothy is his partner and is influential in his ministry. Paul obviously cares about Timothy and writes a few letters to him too, First and Second Timothy. Paul, right off the bat here, wants the Philippians to know that Timothy shares everything he is about to say. That he is not alone in this, Timothy approves. And then he says, servants of Christ Jesus. Now the word for servant here is actually better translated slave. Slave of Christ Jesus. And Paul opens a few of his letters with this terminology. Romans in particular, I, Paul, a servant, a slave of Christ. He wants them to understand just how committed he is to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That to him, he is a slave to it. It's not something he just does. It's not his sideshow. This is who he is. He's a slave to Christ Jesus. And this is strong language, and it's obviously a word in the word slave that brings about a lot of negativity in our day and age. And what I want us to understand is that Paul's use of this word slave isn't to be understood in the same way that we understand slave today in our society. To be a slave to Christ doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus will lord over him with a whip and and mistreat him in any way. Jesus isn't a slave owner in the sense of the way that slave owners misused that position throughout the history of mankind. It means that Paul has completely submitted himself to Jesus and he will live his entire life in servanthood of his master Jesus. 
He has given Jesus complete control over his mind and over his body. And so he has enslaved himself to Jesus, to the cause of Christ. And the reason I spend so much time on that first sentence is to ask us a a question. Would we go that far? Would you characterize your life as that of a slave to Christ? And it's a question that I can't answer for you. And I'm not telling you how to answer it. It's just a question I want us to ponder and to think about and to be an open-ended thought in our mind. Would you characterize your life, would I characterize my life as that of a slave to Christ? It's something worth thinking about. As you consider that question and your answer to that question, I want to tell you that as we go along in today's sermon, you're probably going to get a little bit better idea of what Paul means by that, by that statement. Then he goes on to say, to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's writing this letter to the entire church. He's not playing favorites. This letter is to all the saints. And by saints, he means those who are chosen for God's purpose. He wants them to know that they are partners in this. He's not addressing a certain person or a group of people. He's addressing the entire church with this. He wants the entire church to read it. Then he moves on to verses 3 through 8, which is, which is kind of a prayer of thanks. And he's going he's gonna to pray this prayer of thanks to God. And he says things like, God, uh, he thanks God when he remembers them. He is joyful in his prayers for them. He is thankful that he has partnered with them and they have partnered with him in the gospel from the first day. He knows God is going to do a good work in them. He is thankful that regardless of their circumstances or his circumstances that they face and he faces, that they will always be a faithful partner to the gospel. And as long, uh, uh, and he longs to be with them. That's another thing we have to understand is that he really wants to see them again. That's kind of a quick rundown of the first prayer, but I want to think through verse 6 in particular for just a little bit more detail. And it says this in verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this is the first of quite a few very powerful, well-known scriptures in the book of Philippians. For the most part, we can take this scripture at face value. God has a good work that he is going to bring about through the Philippians. God is working through this church. Paul sees it, and he recognizes it, and Paul wants to encourage this faithfulness within the people of Philippi. Now, for readers in 2024, we see this verse, and we want to apply it to ourselves, that God both starts and finishes a good work within each of us. And I'm not really arguing against that, but I want to be careful in how we apply this individually. First of all, remember that this letter was written to an entire church, not a specific person. The reason I point that out is because it was a collective good, a collective good work that the believers were all a part of, not an individual good work by one person. When the church works together, and this is the key, Because Philippians, they were working together. When the church works together, we are united in our submission to God and our love and care for one another. He works through that unity. When we're together, we're stronger. This isn't a call for individual works. It is Paul commending a church for their submission to Christ and pointing out how God is going to use that for the whole kingdom. Think of it this way. Our faithfulness, we can apply it this way. Our faithfulness now as a church will have long-lasting effects on the faithfulness of generations we will never meet. When the church submits to Christ and is faithful to his calling in the kingdom, we establish a faithfulness that attracts more people to Christ. And he who began that good work in first church is going to bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. The church at Philippi was consistently faithful. 
And Paul will spend a lot of his letter telling them and thanking them for their faithfulness. And because of that faithfulness, God is going to use them to bring more people to the gospel of Jesus all along the way until Christ Jesus comes back. And because of the faithfulness of the church of Philippi, more people know Jesus. And my hope is that because of the faithfulness of First Church, more people will know Jesus. I believe we are, if we are found faithful, then generations will know Christ because of our faithfulness. And I believe God is doing a good work in Owasso, and he will see it through till the end of Christ Jesus, till the day of Christ Jesus. Our position in that is to be faithful and to let God do the work, to submit to Jesus both individually and collectively and watch God bring more people into the kingdom. Along the way, there will be some individual missions that God will lay upon your hearts. And I truly believe that if you are faithful and you are submitted to him, then he will see that good work through to the day of Christ Jesus as well. But understand that this is a church. We are his body. And he's gonna bring that to, in unity to his completion. Paul then goes on to another short prayer, a prayer of intercession in verses 9 through 11. And he asks God that the church's love will abound more and more in knowledge and discernment. He asks that they may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, that they will be filled with righteousness that comes through Christ, and that they will, that would all be to the glory of God. Excuse me for just a second. Let's, let's quickly uh, discuss a few things before we move on. He wants their love to abound more and more in knowledge and discernment. A major theme through the book of Philippians is unity. He wants the church to be united through Christ. He doesn't want quarrels or struggles to create disunity. He wants them to genuinely love one another. And he prays that this kind of love will be developed in them as they learn more about God, as they discern and ask God what he is asking of them. In other words, the church that is focused on Christ and allows his spirit to transform them will grow in the way that they love one another. Let me say that again. The church that is focused on Christ and allows the spirit to transform them will grow in the way they love one another. The church as a whole, not just first church. The church as a whole has a sad history of disunity. And I believe that this has been far and away the most destructive weapon that Satan has used in his quest to stop people from hearing the gospel message. The church fighting with one another. To love and live in unity creates a faith defense against this scheme of Satan. So when the church moves past petty arguments or destructive gossip or prideful arrogance, when the church moves past the I didn't get my way so I'm throwing a fit mentality and chooses instead to love one another in unity, the gospel message is then lived out in a beautiful and practical way and more and more people can know Christ. The question is, are we that kind of church? Can we live in unity with one another in a God-honoring way, even if something doesn't go the way you want it to? Can we, here's a bigger question individually. Can we love even if someone wasn't their best and said something hurtful to us, realizing that they may have been ununifying in their comment, but we can be unifying in our response? That's the love of unity. It's to forgive. This is the kind of love Paul is praying that this church at Philippi has. And I believe it's the kind of love the world is so desperate for the church to display. And it comes through knowledge and discernment of who God is and what he's calling our church to be. Let's continue on. Philippians 1, 12 through 18 I want you to know, dear brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel 
so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my, punish, in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. We discussed earlier that Paul, when writing this letter, was in prison. For the church at Philippi, this was a big deal. They were very worried about Paul, and, and they were going to do whatever they could to help him. They had sent Epaphroditus to Paul in an effort to encourage him and to help him financially. Paul, meanwhile, was consistently sharing the gospel regardless of the situation he found himself in. It is here that we see his passion, the passion that Paul has for the gospel of Jesus. Regardless of his situation, it didn't matter what situation of life he was in, he is praising God because the gospel is advancing. Apparently, his imprisonment had actually increased his audience. The entire imperial guard knew that he was in chains for Christ. And he used that as an opportunity to teach them about Jesus and about faith and about forgiveness of sins, about grace. Furthermore, others who were preaching the gospel as well were encouraged by Paul's faithfulness so much that they actually became more bold. While the Roman leadership had tried to make an example of Paul and stop him from preaching and spreading the church, it had obviously had a different effect than they had anticipated. Other gospel preachers were emboldened in their faith and in their efforts to teach Jesus. Paul's faithfulness, even in a dire situation, had served to advance the kingdom of God. And now this begs the question, how would I respond? And when I say that, I do mean how would you respond, but I also mean how would I respond? For the purpose of asking the question, I'm going to look at it from, from my perspective for a second. I've often wondered how I would react if I were to be tossed into prison for teaching Christ. I, I see the day coming in America where that may become a reality. Whether it's in my lifetime or not, I don't know. But I have to contemplate the idea. I have to, I have to think through that in order to have a plan. Would I be like Paul? Would you be like Paul? Or would I let it defeat me? Paul's attitude in this situation is a foreshadowing of one of the greatest statements of faith that is in Scripture, a statement that we're going to look at in just a couple seconds here. But before we move on to that, I want us to sit here in, in this moment for just a second and consider this hypothetical situation. I know for me, when things get difficult... It's a struggle for me to control my attitude. There's a famous statement out there that all of you have probably heard, right? Uh, when life gives you lemons, what? Make lemonade, right? Well, my track record is that when life gives me lemons, I get frustrated. I'm not sure I make lemonade. I know that's a silly statement, but it's true. What about you? Paul shows us that he's not going to be stopped. He is going to see things through a kingdom mindset. That's what he wants to see things through. His perspective is a kingdom perspective. This is not just Paul spinning a bad thing into a good thing. This is who he is. He has determined who he's going to be, and his circumstances will not dictate his attitude. To do this, to have this same kingdom perspective, you have to be 100% sold out for the cause. When it comes to the cause of Christ, that means a kingdom mindset over an earthly mindset. A kingdom perspective over an earthly perspective. You see, Paul was able to have his mindset 
because he was 100% sold out that life after this world was better than life in this world. He did not waver in this. He knew that he had been forgiven of his sins, sins that he didn't deserve to be forgiven of. And he knew Jesus was all that mattered. So he could spread the message of hope in Christ, even in prison. And he could see how he was encouraging others to be just as bold because he had a kingdom perspective. There's more that we could break down here. He goes into a little bit of a, a, some people are preaching it because of envy, some people are preaching it because of this and that, and then for all things, it's just that Christ was being preached. And it's kind of a weird little section. We could really dissect it, but we're not gonna worry about that right now because we're gonna have the same attitude as Paul. Jesus was being preached, and we rejoice in that. But let's move on to see why. Philippians 1, 19 through 26. This really sets up the rest of the letter. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that, will I, that, I, that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which will I choose, I, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for your progress and joy and faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And there you have it. Paul's mission. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is a kingdom perspective. It's a kingdom perspective that we need to teach ourselves This is a perspective that we need to have in this world and in the next. When we focus on having this perspective, it'll change who we are. When I pole vaulted, I thought I was doing what my coach wanted. Only when I looked at myself and studied what I was doing did I see that my approach was wrong. I saw the the flaws in my approach. And this is what Paul is calling us to here. Change your perspective. To die is truly a gain for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we truly believe that Jesus is coming again and that life after death is real, then as hard as life might be, it doesn't matter what happens to us here on earth. Christ is all that matters. That's a kingdom perspective, not an earthly perspective. The Philippian church was no different than any other church in any other time. Persecution was real. Nero would soon reign in Rome and would torture and kill Christians for his own demented pleasure. Many would be killed for their faith in Christ. Church history is full of people who have had to endure struggle for the cause of Christ. In America, we've had it pretty easy. As weird as it is to say, I I wonder if the ease that we've had has served to make us complacent, has tricked us into a bad perspective that that this world is better than the next. If tomorrow we woke up and it was told to us that we could no longer meet together for worship without being arrested, would we still gather? Sorry, I'm debating whether I want to say it, and I'm just going to say it. They, they did that two years ago. Not the arrested part, but the stop us from being together. We can sit here from our, our situation of being hypothetical, and we can answer yes, but would we? Seriously, stop for just a second and ponder that question. Would we still gather? 
Paul expands this idea in verses 22 and 23. For I, am to, for I am to live in the flesh. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Do we live lives like the kingdom of heaven is better than our earthly experiences? Now, I want, I want to be clear with you. I don't say any of this to suggest that if you've had difficulty or struggle that you've had the wrong attitude. That's not it at all. Life is hard. There are many in this room who've experienced much sorrow and your pain is real and I recognize that pain. But I believe a better day is coming. I believe we can rejoice, as Paul says here, because Jesus will return, and Jesus does forgive, and Jesus is preparing a place for us. So take heart, my friends. Take heart, church. The kingdom of heaven is real. And for those who have placed their hope in Jesus, a better day is coming. And we can grab a hold of that hope and we can tie it around ourselves. We can tie ourselves up in that hope. And when we do that, we join Paul and say, for me to live is Christ every day. And when I die, it's to my gain. The world needs us to have this mentality. The world needs to see this kind of hope. It's infectious. Just look at Paul. In prison, he still preached the truth, and he still fought the good fight, and because that was who he had chosen to be, others were inspired to do the same. First church, is God that important to us? Is Jesus' message of of faithfulness and forgiveness and grace that important to us? So important to us that for us to live means fruitful labor and to die is gain. Paul's writing this letter to the church at Philippi because he wants to encourage them. He wants them to know that nothing is going to stop him from sharing the gospel message. And he wants them to know that they have helped him. And their help has been encouraging to him. And it's helped him be even more bold. And I think it's appropriate for us to look at this letter and understand that our circumstances might be vastly different from the church at Philippi or for Paul, from Paul's experience, for that matter. But the truth behind it remains. The gospel is that important. It's so important that nothing should stop us from living it out and teaching it to others. And when the day that comes that life is over, we walk into a much, much better eternity. Until then, to live is Christ. Amen.